Well, guys, thanks for thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, appreciate you uh, you coming on board. I just want to say a few words um, before I hand over to to Jim and Alex at about this evening. Um, so, uh, just to give you a bit of background on, on tonight, this this is obviously an LJC event. Um, the, the London Java uh, user group. Um, for those of you that this is your, your first event or, um, uh, or indeed if you're tuning in afterwards from around the world, um, the LJC, we're a, a well-established and a very active group. Um, so we've got 7,500 members now, um, run over 600 events and uh, 13 years old. Um, but what really sets the LJC apart, what we, what we really stand for here is the, the values behind it all. Um, which all comes down to, to the kind of the community values and, and the fact that um, really the power of, of us as a community can achieve more than, than, than just an individual. Um, and we've got a number of different examples of that from all the learning and, and support and, and obviously like, like this evening, um, Alex help, helping everyone um, on, on this event. Um, but also there's, there's so many other things that have come out of the LJC on, on the tech side. Uh, adopt a JSR, adopt OpenJDK, and a number of other things. You can go and look into all of them on the website so that I'm not here, here for uh, forever. Um, as for who I am, my name is Barry Cromford. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the founder of uh, the LJC. Um, and I also, uh, I, I'm, I'm not a developer myself, I, I'm, I'm a recruiter. Uh, so I run a, a recruitment company called, called RecWorks, which I know many of you have, um, have worked with in the past. Um, so at RecWorks, we, we believe that Beyond just recruitment, uh, sorry, beyond just making money, uh, recruitment can be a, a power of good in, in the industry and a real force for, for change. Um, and again, a lot of this comes around the, the learning and, and the mentoring. Um, so we see our work as sitting somewhere between giving back to people that we've worked with in the past and, and paying forward to people that we hope to work with at, at one point in the future. Um, so a few examples uh, of what we do. Uh, we, we've, we've organized the, the events, the 600 events within the LJC. Um, we've uh, now introduced over 2,300 uh, mentors and mentees uh, through the Meet to Mentor community. Uh, we've recently started a new aspiring speakers group, which I know both Jim and Alex are, are involved with, um, and, and a number of other things there along the way. So any, any interest in any of that, hit me up on, on LinkedIn, uh, follow me on Twitter, at BC RecWorks. I'll put something on the chat there. Um, and just a reminder that this is all powered by recruitment, so we don't make any money other than anything uh, other than get, getting people jobs. Uh, so, so all the community things, uh, initiatives that we run, they all come off the back of, um, of recruitment. So if, if anybody's interested in, in looking for developers at all, uh, or if anyone's looking for a role, then it's a shout. Anyway, with that, I'll hand over to Jim, who's going to introduce Alex for, for the rest of this evening. So I hope you'll have a, uh, have a very nice evening. Cheers. Thanks, Barry. Yeah, so uh, I'm here again introducing Alex. It's the uh, second time now. I must have done a good job the first time anyway and not put him off. Um, and actually, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce Alex this time around as the London Java community's uh, latest Java champion. Uh, so well done, Alex. I'll, I'll clap when everyone else is on mute, so that might not be uh, uh, quite as powerful as it would have normally been. Um, Alex has been involved in the Java community for many years. Um, I think you first got involved when you were working on migrating a project uh, from Objective C whilst you were at Cambridge, so in the in the nineties. Um, and you, I think the other thing that you've done is is like become a co-founder within like the LJC brand. So uh, the Docklands LJC uh, when that all started up, which is pretty cool, uh, and also spoken at many conferences in, in Q, including recently QCon. Uh, Alex lives in Milton Keynes, which is not far from where I am this evening. So we're broadcasting mainly outside of London, uh, just about north of the wall. Um, in general, then, for, for the logistics, uh, we'll take questions at the end. But if you want to ask anything, um, if, you, if you don't want to ask out loud, you want to just put it on the chat, uh, then I'll be happy to collate those and ask those to Alex at the end. Uh, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Alex to, to present Bite Size Byte Code, uh, Classes and Class Loaders. Thanks a lot, Jim, and thanks a lot, Barry, as well, for uh, inviting me on to give a talk. Um, this talk is going to be about how Java classes and class loaders work and the bytecode that goes inside them. So we're going to start off looking at class loaders, how they fit inside the JVM. We'll have a look at the class file format, what lives inside the dot class files the Java compiler spits out. We'll have a little bit of a look about how some bytecode fits together. And then at the end, I've got a demo. And as Jim said, be happy to answer questions at the end of this. 
So class loaders are really the key thing that allows Java to be dynamic because when Java started, it was brought to the web by having programs that could be compiled once and then run anywhere. And they did that by having a platform neutral bytecode that could run regardless of whether it was a Solaris or Windows or later a Mac OS system. And this is made possible through class loaders. Class loaders job is to take a sequence of bytes from somewhere and then convert that into an executable representation in memory so that you can then run the program. And the idea was initially, and why Java got so powerful, first of all, was that you could download these programs across the web and then run them inside the web browser. Sadly, applets have passed on, but their spirit lives on. Java's dynamic nature, though, still comes from the fact that we have classes that are dynamically loaded into the VM. And what happens when you run your program is the first time your class needs to use, your program needs to use a class, it will trigger the class loader to be able to pull the class up and be able to run it. So when you do something directly by using class.forname and example, that will actually cause the trigger uh, of the class to be loaded if it's not already present. But also when you load that class, if that has class fields or class references inside there, or if you call a method that needs classes, these things are brought on dynamically as the JVM executes. And in fact, you can use the Java logging to find out what classes are being loaded at runtime. If you have a look at the um, xlog uh, implement, uh, argument flag on the JVM, you'll see uh, ways in which you can debug what the classes are being loaded are. Now, the class loaders can be organized in a parental hierarchy. So by default, you get the system class loader or the platform class loader in Java 11, which is the thing that loads all of your application classes. But you can then spawn other classes as well. And this is how application servers like Tomcat or uh, other equivalent J2E servers worked. By having one class loader per application, you can have your application classes loaded in one class loader, and they would not conflict with classes that lived inside another class loader. And that's because when you have an application split into multiple class loaders, that class loader is responsible for dealing with just the classes that it's loaded. Ones that it doesn't know about, it delegates up to its parent, and so its parent can then pick up the classes as well. And in fact, in Tomcat, you often have uh, the whole web app based class loader, which is a separate class loader from the platform one as well. So classes, when you load them, are actually tightly bound to the class loader that defined them. And a class must be uniquely named with inside the class loader. So when you look up a class by name from one class loader and you do it again a second time, you'll get exactly the same class instance back. However, that doesn't mean that the JVM has got a restriction to say classes must be uniquely named. It's one of those common things that you learn when you're learning Java for the first time, that a class is unique inside a JVM, but actually that's not the case. It's unique with inside a class loader. And this is what allows Tomcat to run two web applications side by side using slightly different versions of the classes. For example, uh, the difference between a pre and a prod version of your application and actually not get them confused between the two things. So it is possible in Java to have code where you get hold of an object instance, you ask for its class name, and then you get something back again. But then when you try and do a class cast for it, you get a class cast exception. That typically happens when you're dealing with applications that have multiple class loaders. And you see it sometimes where there's some sort of globally shared state, something like a thread context class loader or uh, some other th um, thread variable that you want to be able to deal with. So how do we load classes then? Well, there are a variety of different standard class loaders that come within the JVM. Now, the one that I mentioned previously, the Apple class loader's job was to be able to take bytecode from a remote website, download it over HTTP, and then cache that jar to be able to load and run the classes inside there. But the Apple class loader is just a specialization of something called a URL class loader. And the URL class loader is something that, given a URL or a set of URLs, will be able to step through and be able to load a class on demand. So that when you look for a class that doesn't exist yet, like an example class, what it will do is it will open up the first URL, it will see if you can find the class there, if it can't find the class there, it will go to the next URL, and it will keep iterating through until either it finds it or it doesn't, and it then delegates up to the parent class loader to load instead. There are a variety of different bytecode manipulation tools that can deal with processing these bytes that sit between the class loader and defining the actual class in the VM itself. So things like ASM, Makito, Bikebody, a byte buddy and so on, uh, can all generate these byte classes on demand. And you can actually create bytes in memory yourself, either by a hard-coded programming language or by translating it from something else. Scala, uh, JRuby, Jython, those are examples of 
other programming languages that can compile down and generate the same bytecode at the end. But in essence, all of the class loaders boil down to get the bytes from somewhere and then call define class. Define class is the JVM hook that translates a sequence of bytes into a class file. Prior to Java 1.7, we used to be able to create classes on the fly by using something called a proxy instance. And this proxy instance was added in Java 1.3 to support the then popular enterprise Java beans. Well, okay, maybe they were never popular, but enterprise Java beans were defined as a bunch of interfaces and application runtime would then create subclasses of that. And this new proxy instance was a way of saying, okay, I've got an interface. It may have a number of methods associated with it. And what I want you to do is essentially wire them all through to this particular one invocation handler. So that when you call a method on the interface, it gets bound into something where you can then do an if test for it. Uh, and in this case, I'm kind of cheating because I'm using a Lambda to be the destination of the invocation handler. But of course, you can create your own uh, invocation handlers as well. Since Java 1.8, we've been able to use method handles and lambdas, and those are a lot easier for being able to do the class creation. So I mention it here for historical reference. It's probably not something that you should be using when you can use uh, lambdas instead. Um, but lambdas actually work by doing the same dynamic class file creation at runtime. If you've ever debugged in a breakpoint in an IDE and looked at the backtrace, you'll see that there's a whole host of generated classes that sit between you and where the original call point is. And all of those are created by the JVM at runtime using the same bytecode that everyone else has access to. So if you want to create classes yourself, you can learn how to speak the, the bytecode and generate it, or you can use a tool like ByteBuddy or ASM to be able to generate those things for you. But if you just want to do something simple, you can actually use the built-in Java tool provider to give you hold of the system class uh, Java compiler. The system Java compiler then deals with something called a file manager. And the file manager's job is sort of like the URL class loader to maintain a set of source directories and a set of target directories. The file manager deals with source files, which are then consumed with the Java compiler, and then generate the class files out at the end. If you use a file manager, and the standard file manager works for being able to load and save content um, to files, then you can actually use this to compile Java source files on the fly. The reason why there's the concept of the file manager in Java C is because the Java compiler is capable of doing recursive compilation. So if you have a class A that inside has a field called B, uh, called class B, and you don't have b.class yet, the file manager and the Java C can work together to find out where b.java is and then compile that for you. And similarly onto C and D as appropriate. And so that's why there's the idea of the file manager that works in conjunction with Java C. I've actually implemented an in-memory file manager that will deal with both source files and class files and host them in memory so that you don't even need to touch the disk for this. And we'll be looking at that later. These class files, though, can be loaded with any class loader. And the class loader will then take the bytes that you've just generated out of your byte and then be able to use it. Of course, one of the problems with loading bytes dy dynamically is that you don't have access to the methods on them. So typically what happens when you're using something like this is that you generate a class that implements an interface, something like runnable or executable or function. And then you can use that in your program. So I've got some code here that shows what that diagram did on the previous page. First of all, we're getting hold of the system Java compiler from the tool provider. That Java compiler gives us access to the file manager. And from that file manager, we can then interact with objects. In this case, I've created a test Java file that implements runnable, and it's got a run method that says hello world. We then need to execute the compilation. So we do java c.gettask.cool. That will then, if it returns successfully, have generated uh, temp test.class in the same location. And then we can load that and be able to execute it. In order to be able to use the class loader, we need to be able to, um, to call define class. So in this particular case, we're creating a class loader solely for the purpose of exposing define class as a public API. And that's because when you have a class loader, you can't just arbitrarily poke classes into it. That would be a bit of a security risk. And so class loader has a method called define class, which is protected. So in other words, only subclasses of class loaders can use that. 
However, we can create one ourselves. In this case, I'm just creating uh, an anonymous subclass of class loader, but you could create a uh, custom named one if you want. And in this case, we're just passing in a method that allows us to load this class as bytes. At the bottom, I'm then loading the bytes down. Um, so we're reading in the content of the test.class file. And then from that, we can create a new instance. And that instance is going to be an object with a dynamic with a uh, class name of test, but that's loaded by the dynamic class loader. So we can't refer to it in the source files, but we know that it implements the runnable interface. So we can cast it to runnable and we can then call one on it and then it'll print out hello world. Now, if you wanted to, you can dig into the class file format to find more information about it. All class files start with a magic OX Cafe Babe. Um, this is the same magic number that is used both by Java and also by Next Maco executables. So if you look in your file command, which tells you what type of file it is, you'll find that both Java classes and Maco have the same detector for using this. After that, there's the major and minor number. Uh, interestingly enough, they have the minor first, then the major. Don't really know why that's the case, uh, but that's tripped me up in the past. And then afterwards, you have something that's called the constant pool. And the constant pool is a variable sized uh, list of constants that make up the file. Um, that wavy line at the end is my notation just to say it's a variable size. Um, so the number of constants in the con pool is identified by this short count at the front. Uh, that means that there's a maximum limit of the number of constants that can fit in any one Java file. And in fact, that same limit is used for the size of code and for the number of fields or methods that you might have inside. Uh, so because these count values are shorts, then you can only have 65536 five, um, classes or fields or methods or bytecodes in a particular method. The only time I have ever come across this outside of the Java certification exams, which ask you it, is one time back in 1997, I think it was, um, when I was teaching some C++ programmers uh, migrating to Java. And I asked, and the person came up to me and he said, well, clearly Java is rubbish because you can only have 65,000 uh, methods in one file. I had to create a second Java class file to move my program over. I'll leave it to you to consider how well-structured his code was. Um, after the constant pool, we then have flags associated with it. So is this public? Is it um, private? Is it protected? Uh, is it final? And so on. And we then have a this and super reference. So the this pointer is the pointer that says what type of class it actually is. And the super is what the super class is. is. But instead of that being a variable name, and a variable length uh, string name, it's actually a short index into the constant pool. So for both of these fields, they are pointers into the constant pool and constant number one will be a string, which is the name of your class. And constant number two will be the name of the superclass of this object. After these fields, we then have, uh, the, uh, we then have a variable number of fields, a variable number of methods, and a variable number of attributes on that. And so as your Java file goes, it's this end of the class file that's going to grow more than anything else. Now, the actual overall structure of the file format hasn't really changed for decades. Although we've had different major versions of class files, we're now in the habit of just incrementing the major version whenever we feel like it and the Java virtual machine is released, rather than actually changing the class file constant itself. There have been a few new constant types added. Uh, so for example, when the um, dynamic constant was created, there was a couple of uh, extra constant types that went inside the constant pool. It still had the overall structure and you were still able to um, process it uh, for the most cases. But actually, the major code is really just an identifier that says what version of Java you compiled against. So what does the constant pool look like? Well, the constant pool is a giant bag of data. Essentially, it is a one indexed set of entries uh, those entries can be variable, can, can be um, different sizes, and they're all identified by a bytes tag that goes on the front. At the moment, there's only something like 20 different tag types that are included in the class file. UTF-8 is represented as the number one, and UTF-8 are the only variable type that exists in there. So UTF-8 has got a short count associated with it, and then the bytes that make up that UTF-8 string. It's not null terminated as in C, it's actually length prefixed or Pascal strings. We then have uh, constants that you can put inside a source file, including an int constant, a float constant, a long constant, and a double constant. And 
these just represent hard-coded values that you might find in your program. So if you have a value of pi 3.141, then that would turn up as a long, co uh, a double constant inside your put constant pool. But we've also got a bunch of other pointers as well. And these pointers essentially form a tree of different types. So on the bottom right of this diagram, we've got a field of class and NAT. Um, this field is presumably a field that's referenced inside the file itself. Um, the class pointer is an index into the classes. So that's pointing to constant number two. And the class constant says the string that I point to is a real class. So in this case, it's pointing to constant number one, which says example. There's also a NAT type, and NAT is just short for name and type. And name and type is essentially a pairing between a UTF-8 string and a corresponding uh, UTF-8 type descriptor. And those type descriptors, you might see if you've ever looked at the output of Java P, it's things like square bracket Z, which says array of Booleans in Java speak. Um, so essentially, this constant pool is a graph, but they're all indexed by the constant pool identifier. That is everything except zero. Zero is kept as null and it doesn't have a value associated with it. The only time that's ever used is in Java Lang objects class where the superclass is listed as zero. And I think zero is essentially reserved for meaning the null value in this case. So that's the constant pool. What happens with the fields and the methods? Well, the fields have the same, and methods have the same format. They have a flag short on the front of it, which contains things like, you know, is it abstract? Is it native? Is it public? Is it private? Is it static? Is it final? And it has a name associated with the field and then a type associated with the flag, uh, with the uh, field as well. And so that's how you get the name and the type uh, described in, in there. There are then some attributes on the end for both fields, methods, and classes. And attributes are an arbitrary length extension that you can attach either at the field level, the method level, or at the class level. And these have an identifier tag at the front of it, which indicates what type it is. Um, it has a length associated with it. And interestingly, the length of these is larger than the number of fields that you can have. And then it has a variable amount of data that follows on length number of bytes. What's interesting with attributes is that unlike constants, where there's a, a predefined tag and everyone knows that one is UTF-8, the attributes have string identified tags. And so, this is used for code, for example. Uh, code is the indicator for a method that says what the bytecode is for that. Exceptions, which says what exceptions a method flows. Uh, the kind of runtime annotations that we've seen, you know, at test or at before um, are represented as an attribute in the class file. Um, but essentially, they're a stringly typed mechanism for attaching arbitrary information onto a class. And quite a lot of the evolution of Java hasn't been changes to the underlying constant pool or the underlying structure, but rather new attribute types that have been put on there. For example, there's a new nest host and nest members attribute type in classes that's there for supporting nest mates in JET 181. The nice thing about attributes is that they're optional. So for example, native and abstract methods have no code attribute associated with them. If you compile something without debugging, then you won't have the line number table uh, or the local variable table uh, that's also added as an attribute inside there. As well as the fields and methods that we've seen, there are some special named methods that exist. CL init or class init is a piece of code that's called when the class is loaded for the first time. This happens when you have static fields that are defined to have values or you have an expression in a static field initializer. You can actually also have static squiggly bracket inside your code and that will be run as part of when the class is loaded as well. Init is a special name for constructor and all of the constructors are called init. They just take different parameter types inside there. And, and they're not called the class name because there's no point in duplicating the class name inside the bytecode itself. You can also have instance initializers, and instance initializers are a pair of open and curly closed braces that exist inside a code. Sometimes it's useful if you have multiple constructors that are taking different varieties of arguments because you're converting between one type and another to have the same common base. And it's typical that you have one master constructor and then everything else uses this to be able to call that. Sometimes that's just not possible. For example, if your superclass has different argument types as well and you need to pass them through as is. And so one thing that you can do to 
optimize common code between those differing constructors is to use the static initializer block and put it in there as well. What will happen when it's compiled is it will just be another init method inside the class file itself. So it will be compiled and does the right thing, but can sometimes reduce code duplication. It's also the kind of trick question that you might see people if they have pasted a code example and wonder why it doesn't work. Um, the other thing that shows up inside the class are accessor methods. So when you have an inner class that refers to an outer class, although the field is marked as private and therefore you can't see it directly or it's not exposed directly, what will the Java compiler will do is it will create a special synthetic method. And that synth synthetic method will be visible to the caller um, so that the, the inner class can access the outer class's members, but it'll have the act synthetic bit set. And so that means it won't show up on introspection tools unless you particularly look for them. So how can you see some of this? Well, Java has got a built-in disassembler for bytecode called Java P. And Java P will allow you to take a class name by class example. Um, you, can op you can optionally put the dot class on the end, but it's not required because it's using a Java class name for it. And you can then print out uh, private information, protected information, or public information for that particular class. If you add dash C on there, it will give you the Java bytecode so that you can see the content. And there's a dash V or verbose option that will allow you to see a lot more detail about the constant pool structure of a class. If you're dealing with things from JARs, you can use the dash CP for class path, or there's a module path equivalent for Java 11 so that you can tell it where to get classes from. Otherwise, it will default to the current directory or whatever your class path environment variable is set up. So here's what Java P looks like when you run it against Java Lang object. In this particular case, it's saying the minor version is zero and the major version is 55. That corresponds with Java 11. We've got some flags in there, uh, set the public and the super bits inside, and that's the value of Rx21 in the flags field. This class is number 17. And if we look in the constant pool number 17, we'll find a class reference. That class reference just has a single integer pointer inside it that points to number 80. And number 80 is a UTF-8 string, which is Java slash lang slash object. The reason why Java classes are Java slash lang slash object and not Java dot lang dot object is because the very first versions of Java didn't have the concept of jar files. And what they would do is they would just look for those individual dot classes on the filing system. And so if you had Java slash lang slash object, it was actually more optimal to be able to look up a file because all you had to do was stick dot class on the end and then look for that by file name. And then when zip files came around in Java 1.1, you could just iterate through the entries and look for the entry that began Java slash lang slash object. And similarly for jar files when they came out in Java 1.2. Fun fact, the only difference between the zip file and the jar file is that jar files are compressed. The original version of Java could not handle compressed zip files. And so that's why they came up with a different name for it. Um, so what else have we got inside here? At number six, there's a string. Uh, the string is hard-coded inside. It's just an at symbol. Uh, that's because Java lang objects hash code uses class name at um, system identity hash. And so that's why that's inside there. Uh, anything else interesting about this? Yeah, it says we've got no interfaces, no fields, and 14 methods inside this particular class. There's also one class level attribute as well. That class level attribute is a source attribute, uh, which says this was compiled from uh, object.java. If we keep going through, we'll see the methods that get printed out as well. In this case, public boolean equals Java lang object, we all know what that is. The descriptor for that, however, you probably haven't seen before. The descriptor for a method is an open parentheses, the arguments, close parentheses, followed by the return value. In this case, Z is used to indicate boolean. So after the close bracket, Z indicates that we've got a method that returns a boolean value. Inside the brackets, every character represents a separate type. So i is for integer, j is long, d is double, f is float. If you had something like math.max and it took in two doubles, that would be open brackets dd, close brackets d as the type descriptor signature. For object types, we need to have a special value inside there. So objects are identified by L values. So in this case, we have L, java slash lang slash object semicolon. And the L and semicolon really bookend the name of the class that you're using inside here. If we had an object, if we had a method that took two objects, we would see L Java slash lang slash object semicolon L Java slash lang slash object semicolon. And so by parsing this through, we can have an identifier of what arguments are mentioned in this. 
but they're all stringly typed. So this allows the JVM to deal with any argument types now and in for the future, because L something semicolon is going to be the name of a class. If it hasn't seen it before, it will pass that into the class loader to be able to get the information it needs to be able to run your code. You might have also heard some of the work that's been going on in JEPS talking about key world for records. There was an idea at some point that Java would deal with value types by using a Q to identicate a value type and L to indicate a reference type. That was a prototype that didn't continue to fruition, uh, but you might have heard people talking about L world and Q world, and that's why. So inside this method, we then have a code attribute because the equals method is non-abstract. The code method inside says we have two locals and two stack values, and we have two arguments inside there. We then have the bytecode. We'll look at the bytecode shortly. And we've got a couple of other attributes inside. We've got a line number table and a local variable table. Those attributes are generated by debug information, and it will tell you where your code is when you're running it. In this particular case, it's saying the line number table um, on line number 58, we're at bytecode position zero within this method. And then if we move on to a different line, say line 159, then we would have 159 colon nine or something, or colon 10. In this particular case, if you were to go to the source of object.java, that's the source file attribute that's at the bottom, and that was the one attribute that was in the class as a whole, then you would find that that is the implementation of equals. And in actual fact, it's all on one line. So that's why we only have one entry inside there. We've also got a local variable table that's used by debuggers to be able to print out information of what it is. So in this case, between bytecode positions 0 and 11, then the thing in local variable slot 0 is the this pointer, the identity of the object that you're calling the equals from. And the thing in slot 1 is the obj parameter. That's the one that's being passed in from the value. Every time you have instance methods, you'll typically find slot 0 containing the this parameter because Effectively, every instance method is prefixed with an invisible this argument in, when it's invoked. So let's have a look at the bytecode in a little bit more details. What do they actually mean? Well, we've got the stacks uh, locals inside here. That says to the JVM, please prepare me an area. I'm going to use a maximum depth of two in the stack. I'm going to use two local variables max. And by the way, we happen to have two arguments that are being passed in. And what happens with the arguments when they're passed in is that they're copied into the local values uh, as the first two values. So the zeroth one is this, and the other one is other. That's the JVM having set up our start. So what happens when we iterate through it? Well, the arrow in, on the left of the zero is showing what the first pointer is. In this case, we're going to do a load zero. And what, we'll, what that does is it takes the value in local variable zero and it pushes it onto the stack. So we end up with this on the stack pointer after that. Once we put that, a load one, we'll then do the same thing, but for position one. So we have this and other inside the stack. And then we have an if call. Now this if call looks like a bit of a mouthful, but essentially it says if a, the reference or address type, when we compare it, are those two addresses equal or not? If they are not equal, we go to position nine. If they are equal, we just follow through to the next one inside. What this does is this does an implicit branch. So the argument nine on the right hand side tells us where to go to if in this particular case, they happen not to be, um, not to be the same. Now importantly, the way that a stack based VM works is that a load and other similar load instructions will push items onto the stack and then operations on those like the if, like add, uh, like divide, like multiply, will consume one or two items on the stack. And if they return a value, then they will push the result onto the stack as well. In this particular case, the if address compare consumes the two values and it doesn't put anything onto the stack because the side effect that it has is it changes what the position of the bytecode is that you're executing. And so now we jump down to position six. Uh, we're, we're doing the iconst zero. What iconst zero will do is that will push a zero onto the stack. And then when we do i return or integer return, the thing that's left on the stack is the return value for the previous method. In this case, zero, because they aren't there. Now, the thing you'll notice is that in this case, we haven't dealt with true or false. We've just dealt with ones and zeros. And that's because bytecode is something that operates on essentially integer level values, or in the case of floating point, floating point values. The bytecode itself, uh, on the whole, mostly encoded as a single byte, which is why it's called the name. 
A few bytecodes take additional operands, but the majority of the bytecodes will operate by pushing and pulling items onto the stack. Bytecodes can either consume things from the stack, they can push a value on the stack, combination of the above, or they can shuffle values between the stack and the local variable table. The local variables are essentially the space for things like, you know, the I loop that you would iterate through when you're writing a for loop inside a method body. The things that each time you're calling the method, you get a fresh set of them. Um, you can also load constants from the class's constant pool. So the same constant pool that we saw a few slides ago, we can then use to bring in values into our program. So here's an example of some of the bytecodes that we have. Uh, we've got new as a mechanism for creating a new instance of something. In this case, the bytecode uh, argument that follows it, the type, isn't actually a fully qualified string, but rather an entry into the class pool. So you can think of the class's constant pool as essentially being an interned set of all of the classes that you might need in the program. And then when you do new, you just say, create me a new class of whatever is in slot two. And that might happen to be a string, it might happen to be a vector, it might happen to be an array. Um, but all of those elements will take up a single bytecode. The new array will deal with primitive value arrays using the type characters Z, B, C, S, I, L, um, and same with uh, doubles and floats as well. Um, a new array is something that will create an array of address types or reference types. So that's what you'd have if you were creating an array of strings or an array of objects, for example. And then there's multi new array, which itself is a reference type. Um, so if you have a two dimensional array, whether it's primitives or objects, it's still a reference to that value. The reason why new array is handled slightly differently for primitive values is because when you're dealing with an array of, say, shorts, you can optimize the storage of the array itself so that you only take up a short's worth of space for each element inside there. Whereas for all of the other ones, they're object reference types and therefore are taking up a full object pointer width. Uh, array length is a bytecode that will take a reference to an array on the stack and then replace it with what the length value of that corresponding to the dot length of an array. A check cost and instance of corresponds to the Java source level counterparts. There's a bunch of invoke methods that you can call inside. Uh, invoke static is when you call a static method like uh, system.gc. Invoke virtual is when you call a instance method that might be overridden, so object.toString. Invoke special is the name that's used for calling constructors. Invoke interface is used when you call an interface method. So you've got something like a runnable and you're calling run on it. And then there's evoke dynamic, which is used since Java 1.7 or has been available since Java 1.7 in the VM, but is primarily used for implementing lambdas uh, these days. There's mathematical operators on there. Most of the mathematical operators will deal with one of four different types of flavors of number, int, long, float, and double. And so you'll have a prefix on the front of all of these things that indicates the math type that you're dealing with. You might also find an A on the front of some of these things for address as well, which is when we're dealing with reference types. So we've got things like uh, negate, add and subtract, multiply, divide, remainder, all of the usual things that you'd expect to find from the Java level uh, uh, operators. Um, these will consume and push elements onto the stacks. So when you do an add, it will take two elements off the stack, do the addition, and then push the result back onto the stack. We've got means of loading constants into the pool. There are some hard-coded constants for all types for zero and one, because zero and one are quite handy for dealing with uh, unit multiplications, additions, and so on. There's also some specific ones for dealing with constants for two, three, four, five, and minus one for integers, because those are common values. If you have something which isn't one of those, you then have to use either a BI push or SI push. And those deal with constants in the byte stream to be able to push that onto the stack. Sometimes that's quite an efficient way of doing it if you're dealing with a number like 17, which is quite small, but you don't necessarily want to represent a constant slot for. For ones that can't be represented in there, there's load constant or LDC. And what LDC will do is it will look into the constant pool in your class file, take the constant value that's associated with that, and then push that onto the stack. And it comes in a few different flavors that we'll talk about. Finally, for references, there's a const null, which allows you to push a null reference onto the stack. Now, we've talked about integer, float, long, and doubles, and we know that those are 32 and 64-bit types, but we haven't really talked about how we go between them or what we deal with the other types inside the JVM. That's really because the JVM only deals with integer, floating, long, and double points. When you want to cast between one and another, yeah, you can use i to f to go from integers to float, or f to i to go from floats to integer, from floats to doubles, 
doubles the longs, longs to integers. So every time you do a cast between one of these things, there's a bytecode operation to do. And there's a cross product of all of these as well. So you can jump from one to another. There aren't the cross products that are used between integer and the other types because they're one way casts. And that's because all of these types are treated as an integer type as far as the JVM is concerned. And the only thing that you're doing when you do I to C is effectively that you're doing a masking of that to cut it down from 32 to 16 or eight bytes on there. Boolean is also included in this list. There isn't a conversion from one to the other, but essentially zero is treated as false and non-zero is treated as true in the JVM. For being able to move these to and from the local stores, um, load and store will load and store variables for an index. Um, there are some references that allow you to load from zero. We saw a load zero being the thing that would loaded the variable at position zero in our local indexes as an array. Um, but there's specific bytecodes for dealing with the zeroth, one, two, and threeth position inside the local variable tint table for integers, longs, floats, doubles, and addresses. If it doesn't fit in any one of those, or you're using more than four variables in your method, then it will encode the 567 as a bytecode uh, operand inside the byte stream. You can also load and peek um, objects inside an array at an index. So there's an A store, an A load, which deals with loading and storing elements into an index. This is the only time where you have other primitive types like B, S, C, I uh, on the front of it, because when you're dealing with objects of that particular type, then they need to know how far they are along. You might notice that there's no array of booleans, and that's because it was decided that the JVM didn't need something for poking and peeking bit values, and instead booleans are just stored inside a byte. So an array of booleans and array of bytes takes exactly the same storage space at one time in the JVM. Um, iInc, uh, get field, put field, get static, put static, deal with incrementing local variables or getting and putting fields, uh, either instance fields or static fields in a particular class. And in those cases, uh, for get field and put field, you have the instance on the top of stack. And so the object that's pointed to at the top of stack, you then use that and poke in a value that is specified by a field specifier. We've had a look at the comparisons for some of them uh, already. Uh, the if ICMP, if ACMP uh, does a jump, if things are equal or not equal, the I and the A are for integer and arrest types. And for reference types, we've also got if null, if non null to do a jump. These jumps use what is called in x86 terms, um, relative instruction pointer jumps. So in other words, go forwards or backwards by a certain number of bytes. Um, those will typically be uh, specified either as a short value or as an integer value, depending on how far you have to be able to jump inside there. But most of them will just be a short offset, either forwards or backwards. For dealing with longs, floats, and doubles, there are some additional comparison operators that compare two longs and then pushes an int on that. So if you're comparing two longs, what would happen is you would do an L comp first of all to convert the result into a, a minus one or plus one or zero. And then you'd use an if to be able to jump to the appropriate case. The F float and double comparisons come in two different flavors, one that ends in a G and one that ends in an L. The only difference between them is what happens if one of the arguments is not a number. And that's because when you're comparing two float values, there are some poison values or nons that exist in the IEEE 754 spec. And when you do a comparison with something that is a NAN, the result is defined as being a NAN. And in this particular case, it's really just saying, do you want plus one or minus one as being, you, you've been tainted with a NAN value inside there. I don't think I've ever seen the difference between this in real production code. I don't even think I've seen it on a Java certification exam. The other type of control flow that exists to switch go to's and uh, JSRs. There are two different implementations for the switch statements, uh, lookup and table switch. Essentially, they're just different encodings. If you have a very small and dense switch statement, like you're switching over the values of a byte, it will probably use a table switch because the table switch allows you to just jump to the, for example, 200th byte offset in there. The lookup table is used if you have a very sparse content and it will do a case-by-case -case comparison of each of the values like you might think a nested if else would do. Um, go to exists to do a direct jump inside. Um, there are some things with, like the underscore w's inside here. Uh, those indicate it's wide. In other words, it takes a slightly bigger offset. 
So go to wouldn't ordinarily take a short, that is a couple of bytes to jump forwards and backwards. If you need to go further than that in your code, you can use go to w, which then gives you a four byte offset forwards or backwards. There's JSR and RET, which are used to jump to another part as a subroutine and then come back again. That was used initially when the first compilers started implementing exception handling, but I've not seen RET and JSR being used in uh, most code or the code patterns that exist in today's Java compilers. Uh, there's throw, which will throw an object of type uh, throwable. And then there's, of course, return, which allows you to bail out of something, either return with no prefix, which is effectively a void return, or something with an integer long float double or address type if you're dealing with an object type. Then there are some to do with stack manipulation. And stack manipulation really is because when you deal with a stack, the only thing you can deal with is the top. And sometimes you need to be able to do things more than that. Probably one of the most common bytecodes that you'll see is DUP or dupe. And what they do is they duplicate the top element or the top but one element or the top but two elements on the stack uh, and put it so that you've got a copy in there. That's useful because every time you have an instruction, the instruction will uh, consume the element on the stack. And so if you want to keep a copy of that around after you've run it, then you need to duplicate the top of the stack first of all, then run your bytecode, which will consume it, and then you've still got your value on the stack itself. The difference between the pop and the pop2 is because of a slight implementation quirk of JVMs. When you have longs and doubles, that is the 64-bit data types, in the first VMs that were implemented on 32-bit systems, they set up the standard so that double will consume two slots on the stack. In other words, when you push a double, you're actually pushing two values on the stack. And when you push a long, you're pushing two values on the stack in effect. Um, so pop2 will duplicate the top two values. And the implication is that it assumes that the top of stack happens to be a long or a double. And you want to duplicate both the high and the low parts of it. It's a bit anachronistic now that everyone's using 64-bit VMs for doing Java processing. However, since all of the bytecode works by calculating the byte and stack offsets, it would be an incompatible change to try and fix it now. And so we have these uh, empty slots that are used in a VM for long and double types. And we have the special DUP2 codes to be able to deal with that. There's a no operation, uh, which is the zero bytecode. That doesn't do anything, just falls through to the end. The only time you see this being used is in the lookup switch and table switch instructions, because they have some padding that's used between the end of the lookup switch bytecode and then the start of the offsets. Um, you can also have it for implementing uh, either dynamic counters like btrace. Uh, if you have a, a knob slide in the front of your method, you can then start poking bytes in it afterwards to do on the fly calculation. Um, but generally speaking, you won't find it not being used in real code. Monitor enter and exit, implement the sort of begin and the end of a synchronized block or a synchronized method. Um, there's a breakpoint instruction which debuggers can put in. So when you set a breakpoint in your favorite IDE, what happens is updating the bytecode of that method on the fly, sticking a breakpoint inside there. Um, incidentally, putting a breakpoint inside a method and running it in a debugger will instantly de-optimize it from any just-in-time compilations, inlining or other optimizations that the JVM has done. So as soon as you have breakpoints inside a running process, then things will slow down. Uh, there's a couple of implementation specific ones, which are essentially like different flavor breakpoints that IDEs can use if they want, but you won't find them in code. And then there's a special bytecode called wide. What the wide bytecode does is it says for some of the operations, like for example, uh, increment or the load store return, normally they will just have a um, single byte inside there. And so for the wide load, instead of the next element, the next operand being a single byte, it will be two bytes. Or if you're doing increment local variable, instead of dealing with two bytes, it will deal with two shorts instead. So we can put this all together and see what it looks like inside a demo. I have created something called the JV emulator. Now what the JV emulator does is it allows you to type in some Java code. Uh, you can compile it. That's using the in-memory bytecode loader that we talked about at the beginning. And then you can invoke it, which will just run it as is, or you can click emulate and be able to come up with a step through walk of what the bytecode actually looks like. So here's the JV emulator. Um, it's written in Swing, as you can probably tell by the absolutely awesome level of graphics. Uh, and bear in mind that uh, this is intended to be a technical demo and therefore set your expectations of the user interface accordingly. Um, so in this particular case, we've got an example with the say hello method. We can compile it and we then get a drop down of the methods that are inside. So if we do say hello and we invoke it, 
then we'll see the output being presented. Hello, LJC jug. Um, just in case you think it's hard coded, then we can put something else inside there. Um, but you can then also hit emulate. What emulate will do is it will open up essentially a stack of what the code looks like under the covers. So in this case, bytecode position zero is the byte B2 that corresponds to the get static bytecode. When we step over that, we'll see we have got the static field and it's put it into the stack on the byte. We can then load the constant that's corresponding with the operands afterwards. And this doesn't print the operands at the moment, um, but it will load the constant string, which is the hello again jug. So this string inside the file is being stored in the constant pool at position something. And when we do LDC, it's taking the constant from the constant pool and then pushing it onto the stack. And then we're invoking a virtual method. So that virtual method is the println method on whatever the result of system out was. So on stack position zero here, that's the position of the output value and it will consume the arguments on the stack as well. And so when you invoke them, you'll see that that turns up down at the bottom inside the output. And then when you return, tells you what the return value happens to be in this case now. So we can do slightly more, slightly less interesting things depending on your point of view. Um, we can uh, find out how long a string is. Um, so when we emulate, when we run this, um, we can put in an argument inside. In this case, we're going to load the element at position zero. That's going to be our string. And the local in this case is initialized to be the set of arguments that you passed in. Uh, so we pass in hello Jim. Uh, we step over and do the invoke virtual, uh, do the A load. So that pushes it onto the stack on the right hand side. Uh, we then do invoke virtual. It consumes the element on the stack and then replaces it with nine, which I guess is how long it takes to say hello Jim. And then when we do integer return, then it comes up with what that integer value happens to be. Now, this isn't spectacularly exciting in the sense that you can see all of this stuff inside your debugger if you wanted to. Um, but the code for this is all available. And because you can type in whatever code you want inside here, uh, you can then play thing, play with it on uh, as you want. So if we have two arguments inside, then we see the two arguments inside here. We load the integer into local in local variable zero, push that on the stack. So that's going to push the two across. We then do integer load at position one. That's going to move this local into the stack. And then we do IAD. So IAD is going to consume the two values on the stack and then replace them with fee. Who knew? Um, and then we do I return, we get three back afterwards. So this is something that you can then play around with to do a variety of different uh, operations on. Um, modulus, for example, do compile, go down in here, do emulate. So if we do five mod two, then they show up here. In this case, we're using an IREM, which is the remainder when doing an integer divider, which in this case is one. Now I have to say that this code is not particularly well documented. There are a couple of documentation things inside there, which you can use for um, dealing with uh, particular edge cases. Um, but it, it, isn't, uh, it, it isn't well documented code. However, it is well tested code. Um, there's 100% test coverage, both on branches and lines. Um, so that's not to say it's bug free. Um, there are some limitations that I've got down at the bottom um, that are worth being aware of. Uh, primarily because I haven't got around to it. Uh, you might notice that the last commit on this was two hours ago and I've been speaking for an hour. So it gives you an idea of how recently I had up, last updated it. Um, but it does have some limitations. So for example, one of the biggest ones is that the new bytecode isn't implemented at the moment. And that's not a um, impossible problem to solve, but it does require a little bit of thinking about it because when you deal with objects and you create them, the JVM implementation deals with creating new and then creating the class constructor as two separate bytecodes. Whereas because I'm implementing this in Java, I don't have a way of being able to deal with those as separate items. Similarly with the synchronized blocks with monitor exit and mon monitor enter and monitor exit, it's not something that ex lends itself particularly well for an implementation in Java uh, when you're trying to implement the Java code. And there's some others that I simply haven't got around to doing, like, for example, dealing with wide bytecodes will affect the bytecode stream. So lots of things aren't likely to work in it, but it does allow you to play around with some of the implementations of methods that you might have. And provided that you're not dealing with creating new objects, it's something that you should then be able to uh, play around with.
if you have an existing Java path for uh, an accessor method, like you're doing stream of int, for example, that should work, uh, that, that should notionally work fine because you're then calling a method and that method is doing the new. And in the code base, when we're calling something like s.length on the string uh, in invoke virtual, um, so let's just do that again quickly. Um, oh, I'm doing add again, sorry. Just choose a different one inside here. Um, so when I'm doing invoke virtual, what you'd then expect in a debugger is you would then step into the implementation of that method and be able to drill further, whereas this is just actually invoking the method in the JVM itself and giving you the return value. So it doesn't step into it, therefore doesn't have the limitations. Um, but, you know, I may fix some of these problems afterwards. I primarily wrote this for the purposes of this presentation, so it's not uh, production level software that I expect to expect to be looking after for a long time, but at least it's something fun that you can play around with and you can see how, firstly, how you can do com compilation of Java classes on the fly. So when I do invoke, for example, um, and come back with an answer, that's just calling the standard introspection methods inside there. Um, so you can do compilation of class files on the fly using memory bytecode and then be able to interact with them. And that's really one of the reasons why I created the um, code inside here for what it is. Now, if you want to play around with it and see things, um, the main method is split up into the user interface. So that's the GUI and the other swing goodness that we've talked about inside there. Um, there are some files in here for dealing with the structure of class files. So if you wanted to, um, you can create a Java class from a data input stream, byte array or uh, file, whatever else, and then be able to read and poke around with the methods inside. Um, uh, there's a JVM frame, which is really the entry point for a single method bytecode. I've got a list of what all of the opcodes are inside, and then there is the um, hooks for the compiler as well. So this is where the in-memory file manager and in-memory class loader is for dealing with things. So if you just wanted to play around with compiling Java classes on the fly, then uh, you could have a look there. Now, I would say that there are a whole bunch of other tools that are available and a lot better ones for being able to deal with Java class file creation than my monstrous creations. ByteBuddy is a great one if you want a high level, a high level API for being able to create classes. Um, most tools like ByteBuddy will sit on top of ASM, which is the thing that actually does the low level peaking and poking of values. Um, and interestingly enough, one of the reasons why a lot of libraries maybe took their time in moving over to Java 11 when it first came out was because there were some new bytecodes and there was a new major version number that needed to be picked up. And so tools like ASM had to take advantage of those first of all, and then the next level tools like ByteBuddy had to take advantage of them, and then the next level libraries that happen to use ByteBuddy need to take advantage of them. And so it was essentially a slow domino fall of uh, libraries that were updated to Java 11 support. Most of them do have that now. so you should be able to use them uh, without any real problems, but it's just one of those domino effects that takes a while. But if you're looking at high level manipulation of bytecode, I'd recommend ByteBuddy. If you're looking at lower level peeking and poking around of byte files, then I would use ASM for production level work. If you just wanna find out how it works, you might wanna take a look at that repository. So what have we talked about in this presentation? Uh, we talked about how Java class files define a class along with methods, fields, and attributes. Uh, we talked about how class loaders take in a sequence of bytes and then use that to spit out a class, which you can then interact with and run code on there. We talked about how the method bytecode is stored in code attributes, and we've seen what some of that bytecode looks like on a stack through the JVM emulator. Um, we've talked about how the stack and locals deal only with integer, long, float, double, and reference types, and anything smaller than that are essentially on-the-fly cast conversions that the JVM transparently puts in when you use smaller values. Um, and so if you're thinking of using um, cars or shorts because you think it's going to take up less space, you're actually causing your programs to be slightly bigger and not saving any space at all. Um, the only time when using a short of byte or car saves any space at all is when you're dealing with the ways of them. Uh, and that's the only time it's going to make any difference. Otherwise, it will just make your code slightly larger uh, without particular benefits on that. Um, and we also talked about how opcodes work and how they consume either operands from the bytecode stream or whether they load and push and pull things to the stack, load and store local variables, or deal with constant pools. And so just after eight, 
come to the end, I'd like to say thank you very much. I've got some links down here. I have published the slides of this to my speaker deck, which is the one at the bottom. Um, this will be recorded and made available on the London Java community YouTube channel at some point in the future. So follow LJC Jug to find out when that is. And now I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. That was, uh, that was really good. Uh, definitely one tool I'd add on to the list, for, just because it's from the Adopt Open JDK program, would be JitWatch, um, which actually, when you were demoing your uh, view there, that kind of tri-state view reminded me of uh, the tooling of using JitWatch to look at bytecode and assembly generated out of the back of uh, yeah, out of the back of the out of back comp compilation, which is pretty cool. Uh, there are a couple of questions that have come in on the chat that I managed to to gleam out. Uh, one of them was, in what way does the Java module system interact with class loaders, if at all? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so there are different ways of implementing uh, module systems in Java using class loaders to enforce partitioning between classes. The JPMS doesn't take that approach. Um, instead, what it does is it uses a bunch of on-the-fly uh, one-time security permissions checks when you call from one method in one module into another module. Um, in other words, you don't get the same level of security using Java modules as you would with uh, using either an application or a module system that uses class loaders to be able to do the partitioning, but it mostly works for what it needs to do. Um, the Java module system was a great step forwards in the modularization of the JDK. It allowed us to ship smaller JVM images with things like JLink to be able to compress things down. But I don't necessarily know that many people have moved on to using the Java module system for writing modularized applications. The majority of applications that I see are still ones that are using um, the class path, um, the unnamed module, as it were, for being able to develop things. What we're actually seeing, in fact, is people having not taken advantage of the module system in quite some way, but using tools like uh, Graal VM to be able to compile to native code. Uh, once you compile down to native code, you kind of throw a lot of these questions out of the way. So uh, we're seeing uh, application tools like Quarkus be able to take advantage of Graal VM for being able to produce much smaller code. And I think realistically, that's where we're going to see small one times coming from rather than the JLink or J module approach. But what I would say is JPMS was a great way of modularizing the JVM. It was a great way of being able to jettison packages like Java SQL support, for example, if you don't need it for your application, um, or uh, if you're pulling out Java beans from your application, or if you don't need AWT, then it was a great way of being able to ship, ship something that runs on a much smaller VM image. Um, but I don't see many people writing Java modules explicitly to be able to deal with that. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Uh, the other one was a bit more around security. So class load is... Uh, could potentially open up security issues. Uh, have there any be, been any security improvements around class loaders that have been applied as versions of the J as of Java have moved on? Yeah, so it's a good question about security of classes that get loaded. I'm not sure whether that's the class loader's fault as much as the fact that it's been possible to dynamically load new content into an application after it started. In other words, I don't think it's a security bug in the class loader itself as much as the general pattern of being able to extend your runtime as you go. And the reason why that's important is because if you are using common libraries, like there used to be something called expression language or EL. Uh, I don't know if people still end up using it, but it was something that was introduced in the JSP um, stages when people were writing web pages in Java rather than in JavaScript and Angular. And what that would allow you to do would be able to for, format expressions of particular object types. Um, so the way that that could be extended for other object types and indeed with parsing, parsing other objects for serialization was that there was some uh, additional libraries that said, you know, when you want to parse or when you want to format something else, we'll allow you to pass in a custom formatter object. The problem was that that custom formatter object could then be defined as a class file. And that class file could then be passed in as bytes to the application. So it wasn't so much an issue with class loaders as much as people were writing libraries where they said, oh, and by the way, you can pass in a bunch of bytes and we'll convert that to a class for you in order to deserialize this particular object or format this particular reference. 
And that was great at the time when people were starting to do those things, but then people stopped using them, they forgot about them, things tended to evolve. But then much later on, you suddenly found that these were security vulnerabilities because people had figured out that if by type punning the data that went into an application, they could convince the program that actually it was passing in a class file and it would need to then convert it into a class in order to do things, you then open yourself up to those security vulnerabilities. So it was more to do with holes in the parsing and deserialization of input data that then triggered the class loaders to load the classes as rather than the class loaders themselves causing problems. Oh, well, thanks, Alex. Uh, so a couple more coming in now. Uh, are there any recommendations on working with bytecode programmatically in production code outside of specialist areas? Um, I'm not entirely convinced I understood the question. Is it the case of, you know, why would you want to do this in production? I think I think that might be what it's getting at, as in, should you do this? <laughs> at Fair least um, okay. I'm looking for permission, so, Alex, maybe. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So um, there are certainly cases in production where you want to be able to uh, generate something at runtime that will then run faster than if you are just doing an interpreted loop on it yourself. So things like pattern matching, regular expressions, formatting strings, and so on, are all the kind of things that historically have been done through interpretation, first of all, and then moved on to a uh, more compiled approach afterwards. Um, so if you're doing pattern matching in Java, there's a um, string match command. So you can say, does this match this particular regular expression? And you pass in the regular expression as a string, and that string will just be interpreted every single time you do that parse. Um, what's ironic is that when you're doing regular expression matching in Java, it is easier to do the wrong thing than it is to do the right thing. And so as a result of which, people tend to do the wrong thing more often. If you do something like pattern.compile with a string, it will then give you something back, which will give you the answer a lot faster the next time you happen to use it. And so using pattern.compile is an example of something where you would want to generate dynamic code at runtime based on the content of your code so that you can have something that's faster. And that's pretty much what uh, Invoke Dynamic does. So there was a uh, string concatenation um, that um, Indy Concat that used Invoke Dynamic instead of a string builder to be able to concatenate strings together. And that spread things up as well. So there are certainly use cases where that would happen. Uh, some places where you might want to do it uh, if you have some kind of object relational mapping and you want to map some objects to an SQL command or vice versa, instead of interpreting the mapping file that you're using for that, you could load the mapping file once, create that into bytecode, and then use that bytecode class for doing the mapping and deserialization and serialization on the fly. Um, so those are some cases where you could use it. Whether or not you should, or whether or not you could find places to use it, but you're just using it because of the sake of using it, I don't really know. Um, I would say that things like Java Util Function and Lambdas have made it a lot easier to either create bytecode on the fly for generating Lambdas, or actually preferably using a method handle, because method handles work a lot better than dynamic uh, inline Lambdas uh, generally tend to. Um, and that's an example of generating something on the fly as well. So I, I'd argue that we are actually using it in quite a lot of places under the covers, um, even if you don't necessarily know about it. And of course, yeah. things like uh, Makito and other such mocking systems will use this as well. Yeah, I think that's what Jan was getting at. So I think he, he kind of called out those use cases that you just mentioned. And I think he was kind of thinking about, should we be almost like as developers trying to, on a non-specialist product, try and... I don't know, be arbitrarily compiling code and running it. I think the answer is think long and hard, which is kind of come back and, uh, and clarified there. Um, Muzumil, I think you've got your hand raised here. Do you want to ask your question in person? Okay, maybe that, that could be an accidental hand raise. So I would, no, I would no, put no, you no. in. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering, I was fascinated by the, um, the design of the, um, the class file itself and I was wondering that is it that the final fields go into the constants and if yes is it that something occurs to me that maybe we can use and assign different values to final if we use different class loaders to load the class okay so I think um, if I understand your question 
correctly, you're saying, can you use a custom class loader to load in a class and then transform it on the fly before it actually gets defined, for example, to change uh, final variables? Yes, uh, eventually uh, I was thinking of a case whether we have the same class loaded by two different class loaders, but having two different values assigned to the final attributes. Yeah, so it's certainly possible to transfer transform classes on the fly by uh, loading them in and, and then doing something with it before you pass it on to define class. And in fact, there are two transformation agents that the JVM supports to allow you to do that. That's probably another talk again. So um, hopefully Jim and Barry won't hassle me for that one uh, anytime soon. But uh, there's a couple of transformation agents that you can use, one of which hooks into the JVM whilst it's running and retransforms classes that are already in memory. And there's an agent approach which allows you to bind something so that at startup you pipe all of the classes through this transformation agent um, to be able to do processing on them. And those are both good ways of doing the kind of changes that you're talking about there. What I would caution is that if you have particularly constant int values, um, those constant int values can it's one of the few optimizations that the Java compiler actually does, which is to take a constant int value and then make that part of the um, part of the uh, encoded bytecode of the method itself. So if you have a constant field, instead of referring to the value of the field each time, it just copies the value at compile time and then it just uses that at runtime. In those cases, were you to change the field, it would have no effect on your code because it's not looking at it anymore. Um, so depending on what type of value it is, you might find that that's not going to help you at all. Um, if you are dealing with a situation where you have a class file and you want to load the production environment or the, in, or the test environment, um, you might be better off having two separate classes. So in other words, have the class files for both prod, prod and non-prod available in your application. And then at one time when you start up, once you figure out which environment you're in, then loading that class as the one subclass that you're going to delegate uh, permissions to, because then you're not going to run into problems where uh, inline constants are going to come and bite you. Right. So is, is it not the one of the security vulnerabilities, again, uh, that by design, the final should not be changed? Uh, but by using the different class folders, we are allowed to use it? Um, I wouldn't say that final should be considered to be a security restriction, um, simply because finals can be changed at runtime by the JVM anyway. Um, whether or not you use unsafe to then change the accessibility field to poke the, the value differently, or whether you write a JNI um, external class file that does the code changes from a C level rather than a Java level. I don't think assuming that final means final is a valid security posture to start with. Yeah, and I think I think for most applications, you're just going to be using the default class loader anyway. I think you've got to make an explicit choice to be bringing in something like Alex's special class loader as an example. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely something to, or it, it's inherent in the framework that you're using. Um, Alex, we have a few more questions. I don't know if you've got time uh, for maybe. I've got a time, more. and I've got a cold cup of tea, so that works. Uh, okay, or, or, or I would say optimal, but maybe not quite. Um, so one one thing is a point on the presentation. You mentioned uh, a local variable table was used by debuggers. Is it a separate thing from local variable arrays? Um, so what's the local variable array that we're being referred to here? Yeah, I've, I missed the context on the slide, to be honest. I think I was at 8.05, so may, I'll, I'll ask uh, Gokhan if you can perhaps clarify the question, and we'll come back Am to I that one. Am I still showing second. my screen? Uh, no, Am I still showing? Okay, there we okay, go. Okay, you can see it now. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't quite clear where the, um, uh, the issue was with the local variables. Was this when we were talking about um, this display of Java P? Yeah, exactly. That was the one. Um, so yeah, the local variable table here is saying that between zero and eleven, the value in slot zero corresponds with the this pointer, and the value in slot one corresponds with the object pointer. Um, so if you had lots of variables and lots of fields, um, you can think of the local variables as either being the maximum number of local variables that you use, such that each variable has its own one 
or if you have code that's compact and you've got a four i loop here and a four i loop underneath and another four i loop underneath well actually all of those i's could share the same value um the, the same slot for storing the values in because they wouldn't be visible at the same time so the local variable table is, is just a way of decoding what the locals um that's the uh the things on on this side what they happen to correspond to at any one particular time and so it allows you to say that the content of this happens to be associated with the this variable in your source code um, i've used this and other here purely from a reference point of view but yeah. at one time they'd just be pointers into the state yeah, okay I, I heard that you mentioned uh debuggers explicitly so i thought that this was something different but uh, now i know it's not so thank you yeah so you, you can have a look inside if you, if you do um a yeah. java p on here you, you can actually see what the content is of um of the files and and clearly you know there are some places where um these values uh will differ over time but i mean there's more interesting classes to look at than java lang object it's just that java lang object is the one thing that everyone's guaranteed to have and so it might be it's an easy one to um to, to use as a demonstration point of view cool. so i think one final question which will wrap this all up quite nicely is um Jan has asked, how do bytecode obfuscators work, i.e. those muddling up class files so they can still be run, uh, but could potentially cause errors on decompiling? That is an excellent question. Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> um, so th th the point is that um, the class file format is relatively well understood and is relatively um, easy to see and, and to poke around so actually once you start recognizing some of the patterns inside uh, files you can then almost read it and translate it mentally back to what source files use and that's actually what decompilers do so intellij has got a decompiler built in uh, that's based off the fernflower decompiler there are other ones as well and essentially they're just looking for patterns of things and reconstituting uh, arguments from them what obfuscators do is that they shuffle around these um, instructions so that they don't have the same kind of um, th they don't have the same patterns that Java compilers will use but will have the same effect so in other words um, here we're doing a long const zero and then a long comp to, to uh, do the comparison um, maybe this could be done by loading in a random other constant and then XORing it with another constant and then if the bit seven happens to be set on that jump somewhere else and that would generate very different code that would be displayed as part of the decompiler but it wouldn't necessarily behave any differently when it terms uh, of running it it's also possible that the decompilers could insert junk into the bytecode stream as well. So if you have, say, um, a, a method that says it only needs four locals, and then you try and access the seventh local inside there, you're going to get some runtime problem. But if you go to to jump over it, you never need to see the offending instruction inside there. So that poison instruction might not affect the runtime of the code, but it might affect decompilers because they would then try and access what the seventh position is, and they wouldn't be able to find it. Um, the other thing that they might do is they might also put in um, attributes that aren't understood. Um, they might use multiple variations. So although it isn't a given, the class file format assumes that uh, because of, of the pointers that were used, let me just see if I can um, pull up the slide here. Um, because these pointers are derived so that you can effectively uniquify or intern some of these references it's not expected that you'll see the string example multiple times inside your source file um, but there's nothing to stop it from being there and it wouldn't be an invalid bytecode file to have that so you could have this repeated multiple times or you can have some constants inside there um, repeated but using a mask or using a bit rotation or something to be able to obfuscate the true values inside there so there's lots of things that you can do at an individual level. Uh, it won't stop someone from being able to deobfuscate it uh, or recompile it, but it would allow you to uh, make it a lot harder to understand what's going on. And the other thing that you could do is you could put something in the initializer of a class that when the class was loaded, it checked the MD5 value of the class file. And if the class file was different, then, you know, abort, right? So one of the reasons for doing decompilation is because you want to understand it, but another one is because you want to recompile it. And if you then recompiled it and it then failed well, after you'd recompiled it because you've changed some of the things, then that might be uh, an example of uh, a reason why, you, a reason how you can prevent uh, the obfuscators from running. 
Uh, but essentially, it's an arms race between people who are trying to obfuscate the code and people who are trying to decompile obfuscated code. Uh, and that will continue for some time to come, I feel. Awesome. Okay, so thanks very much. Um, hopefully the recording will be available. I have made the um, presentation available on speaker deck. Um, along with my other ones, if I can spell speaker deck properly, uh, if I can spell my name properly. <laughs> Good news. Um, so yeah, the, the presentation's up here and you can then step through that on your own. And hopefully when the recording will be available, then uh, LGC Jug will uh, tweet about it and you can get it from there. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks very much for your time, Alex. That was great. Thank you everyone for attending. Catch you all soon. Cheers.